The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good feed in your, seat, in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. The Lord, please bless the words of my mouth to the ears of those who will hear them. Amen. In many ways, I feel like today's gospel text is a lot more self-explanatory than most. Jesus tells the parable of the weeds to the multitudes, and then Jesus himself explains the parable to the disciples. But upon further reflection, there are definitely a few things that stick out to me that I think we can use as reminders for ourselves. So we're definitely gonna come back to that, but I want us to actually start with our first reading from Isaiah. As I was preparing this week and reading and praying and reflecting and just really asking the Lord to simply let his words come out of my mouth, he was showing me how our scriptures today build on top of each other. And so that is really what I'm excited to share with you today. So as we look at our first reading from Isaiah 44, in verse six, the Lord says, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. This, my friends, is our foundational truth. There is but one true God, one creator, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, right? One alpha and omega, one beginning, one end. And that is where we start. And then in verse 8, the Lord says, Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. This is a huge reminder for us today that we have centuries of proof, of evidence that God can indeed be trusted, that he will do what he says, that his word will indeed come to pass, that he loves us, that he is good. Yet, when things tend to go bad or wrong, poorly, or it's not up to our expectations, we tend to want to blame God instead of turning that focus on us. We're mad at God because he didn't give us what we wanted when we never even bothered to ask if what we wanted was part of his plan for us in the first place. We make plans and then ask God to bless them, 
instead of seeking his counsel and his plan and his will for our lives. First, he can be trusted. We have mountains of evidence to support that. The question is, can we be trusted? A few Sundays ago, I visited St. Timothy's Episcopal, and during the sermon, I had what I will call a sit-back moment. As you all may know, I like to scribble notes. My bulletins are full of them during the sermon, and this occasion was no different. Uh, Pastor Alice, who's the pastor over there, was preaching about the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, where the Lord calls Abraham and tells him to sacrifice his son Isaac as a burnt offering. Now, aside from my own sideways glance on that, you know, Abraham gets up the next morning, he saddles his donkeys, he gets the wood, he takes Isaac and two other young men, and off they go. Now, friends, it occurred to me, as I was sitting in the pew visualizing this scene, that I would have asked questions. <laughs> I would not have simply gotten up and done, I would have asked questions. The first one being, why? Uh, you know, and that's okay, that's okay. Obviously, I'm not at the same level of faith as Abraham, and that's all right. Um, you know, obedience to the Lord is something I've been working really hard on these last few years, but this was a reminder that I've got more work to do. Fair enough. And that's when Pastor Alice said something that really made me, st made me stop writing and sit back. I had always viewed this story as one of obedience of Abraham's obedience to God. God said, do this, and Abraham did it. And I was like, yes, like that's, that's the goal, right? That's the obedience goal. God says, do it, and you do it. And then Pastor Alice said, this is not a story about obedience. It's a story about trust. Hmm. Well, obviously, Abraham had bottomless trust in God, right? If you go back through Abraham's story, my goodness bottomless trust. But the test was not to see if Abraham could trust God. It was to see if God could trust Abraham. Could he trust Abraham to listen and obey? With the life of his one and only son, Isaac, on the line. We know that God can be trusted. But can God trust us. Now, while you let that question roll around and marinate, okay, let's ask another one that might be a little bit easier for us to find an answer to and maybe not quite so uncomfortable. How can we be found worthy of God's trust? Well, we have a good place to start in Psalm 86, verse 11. The psalmist writes, teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. This tells us that we need to have a willingness to learn. We need to be teachable. We need a heart that is open to God's will and discernment to know what God is speaking to us. And we need to be humble enough to know that we don't know what we don't know. And the prayer of the psalmist for an undivided heart, now that one really, really kind of struck a chord with me. And maybe you can relate to the desire to have an undivided heart because like me, you know all too well what it's like to have a heart that's divided between God and the world. The struggle between the spirit and the flesh. And maybe that's why we struggle so much to just simply listen and obey. We overcomplicate the simplicity of the good life with God because we're so distracted with the things of the world. We fall prey to what we call shiny object syndrome. I'm a big, yeah, I'm working on that one. Whew, Lord's been working on me with that one for a while. Instead of just focusing on living a life of obedience to God. And Pastor Jackie actually talked about that very struggle a couple of Sundays ago as Paul was lamenting his frustration in the flesh. And thankfully, we don't have to stay stuck there. I mean, is it a lifelong battle? Maybe. More realistically, probably. But Paul shares a beautiful reminder for us in our second reading today. 
In Romans 8, 15 through 18, Paul tells us, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. And when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. Talk about giving the comparison game a whole new perspective. So often we find ourselves trapped in the temporal, in what we see right before us. And the reality is when we do that, we're operating from a perspective of the flesh. In order for us to shift to a spirit-led perspective, we have to change what we're looking at. We have to change what we're comparing. What if, instead of comparing what we don't have or what we do have with what somebody else does have or doesn't have, We compare the size of the troubles we face to the size of our God. What if we compare what's here and now with what we know is coming, the glory that we know is coming? What if we take a closer look at what's temporary and what's eternal? and put more of our focus on things, doing things, being about things that create eternal impact. Paul reminds us that we who follow Christ are called to suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Now that doesn't mean that as Christians we are to live a miserable existence on this earth. God did not put us here to punish us. But we must know and understand that we will face trials and suffering in this life. Jesus suffered far more than we could ever imagine. Not just in his physical death on the cross, but think of the pain and the anguish that he must have felt to look into the eyes of countless people and to know that they would reject him and ultimately spend eternity apart from him. How heartbreaking it must have been for our Savior to see the lost and to know that they would choose to stay that way. Now, heaven indeed rejoices over every single soul that is saved, but it also pains our Lord to see those who would choose to turn away and be lost to the evil one. And that's why Jesus gave us the Great Commission, right? In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, after his resurrection, Jesus says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And yes, indeed, everyone has to make that decision for themselves. But, you know, it's really hard to make the best decision when you don't have all the information. That's why we share the gospel. That's why we share our testimonies, to tell of what Jesus has done, to show what has happened in our lives because of him, to share the love of Christ, to let people know that there's another way, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to get to the Father without going through him. Now, before I close and wrap everything up, I want to go back to our gospel text for just a minute because, as I said before, I I kind of feel like this one's more easy to understand than some of our other ones, but I'm always amazed at how much deeper we can go in Scripture. Now, it's important for us to note that the weeds that were sown among the wheat weren't just any old weeds, right? They weren't dandelions. They weren't some of the other weed flowers that I love so much. Give me a bouquet of weed flowers any day over the stuff at the store. I love the wildflowers. But they weren't just any old weeds. The King James Version calls them tares. And these are weeds that actually look very much like wheat. 
but they're poisonous. In his explanation of the parable, Jesus tells us that these weeds are children of the evil one sown by the devil. Now, it may be tempting for us to think that these weeds would be easily recognizable to us, right? But that simply isn't the case because counterfeits aren't always easy to spot. The tares, or darnel weeds, look very much like the wheat, but they don't produce the same fruit. In a, a blog post about this parable, Ted Bowling writes, quote, the high value and health properties of wheat are opposite to the common and harmful properties of Darnell, yet in Christ's parable, the owner of the field allows both to grow together. One reason is because wheat and Darnell are exact in their appearance during growth. Both plants are lush green and can be distinguished only when they mature and produce fruit. Wheat berries are large and golden, while Darnell berries are small and gray. Thus, if the farmer attempted to uproot the tares before maturity, he would wreak havoc on his wheat." End quote. You guys didn't know you were going to get an agricultural lesson today, did you? <laughs> so what then are we to do about these weeds? The short answer is nothing. In the parable, the workers ask the owner if he wants them to go out and gather the weeds to pull them up, to get them out of the ground, to get rid of them. And the field owner tells them, no, let them grow together until the harvest. So friends, it's not our job to seek out and pull the weeds. The reapers will do that. And it's not our job to judge the weeds either. That's above our pay grade. We are to be aware of the weeds to know they exist, and to examine ourselves to make sure that we are following Christ, not anyone else. We are to continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus, the outstretched arm of mercy, kindness, and grace, extending to others what has so freely been extended to us. We are to bear good fruit, for others to recognize Christ in us so that they too may come to know the love of God and receive the gift of salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the job that we have been entrusted to do. Be it on a grand stage, reaching millions of people around the world, or simply in our everyday encounters. We are ambassadors for Christ. Let us work each day to show God that he can trust us with what he has given us. Amen.